It's good to see all of you this morning. All the gospel-enabled chatter that fills the halls of Veritas Community Church. It's a joy to our hearts to listen to the music of the gospel as you spread his grace to one another. Greetings. Good morning. My name is Dan, and I'm a pastor here at Veritas. Um, we've been out for some time, so I thought I would start with an introduction, not just to those of you who might be here for the first or second time, but for all of you. I am uh, delighted to, to be back, to be home. We went and traveled out to Seattle and on into a secluded place called uh, Lake Chelan. Anyone been there? Okay, that illustration's jettisoned. So it was a wonderful time there. It's a beautiful place, and it's, it's good to be back home. I thought I'd start off this message this morning. You'll find it in Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. It's a parable. And I thought I'd start this morning's message by giving you a little snippet of my um, years way, 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 way back in 1986. And in 1986, I was in Hawaii, and I jumped onto a plane, or rather went into a plane, and flew over to Portland, Oregon, where I was visiting uh, my, my future university. I was getting out of the military, and I was going back into school, and I had a stint of education that lasted some time, and it was a marvelous experience for me. I didn't know this place um, too well, though I knew I wanted to be there, so I flew over, and unbeknownst to anyone, I didn't know anyone, so it didn't matter, um, I um, got there, and day one, I went to a lecture, a big lecture hall, I don't know, it seated maybe 200 or 300, and I got into the front row, and I wanted to get as close to the professor as I possibly could, and so I was sitting there um, with my Bible in lap, and out came the professor. His, his gait was shuffling. His, his stature was somewhat stooped. He looked tired, haggard, and he shuffled into the lectern, and he turned around to look at all the people. Then he put his Bible down, and he flipped to a passage, and he had a few notes that were kind of scattered around here. And he was 94 years old. And I was looking at him like, what are you going to deliver? And he said, I want you to open your Bibles and turn to John. And we went to a passage, so we quickly went there. Now, being that I'm in the front row, I can see a lot of what he's doing. And I was certainly listening to him, but I was watching his mannerisms and how you would put things and how you would set things and how you would deliver things and so forth. And he opened his Bible kind of like this. Didn't know if that was just marked that way or whatnot. And then he had these shufflings of papers. And then he said, uh, let us pray. We prayed. And then he started reading the text. And it appeared to me, it was, it was verbatim, I was, I was looking at my Bible and it was verbatim, but his milky, weakened eyes weren't landing on this book in front of him very often, and it didn't even look like he was reading it, yet he was reciting it word for word. That was unusual. And then he said, so, what we see here today is, and for 40 minutes... He lectured, if that's what you want to call it, the, the glories of God in Jesus Christ in the pages of Scripture in the Gospel according to John. I don't believe it was, it was tears, it was a celebration. I didn't even know how to respond to it other than worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ himself. And so when it was over, still dripping with tears off of my cheeks, I went right up to the platform, right to the lectern, and I just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Mitchell. And he, he kind of gently grinned at me, and I said, so I just have one question. 
He said, what is it? And he said, I said, how do you do that? Look at me with great pity as well as wisdom and with his, his Scottish brogue or Scottish accent, he said, Laddie, don't you read your Bible? Now, I've been a Christian for two whole years at this point. I had, I had read this book from Genesis to Revelation two times now, and, and I, I memorized dozens of passages, maybe, maybe even up to a hundred I had a voracious appetite due to being reborn. And, and I just thought, for sure I knew the scriptures. And that's what he said. Laddie, don't you even read your Bible? I didn't know what to say. Vonda. What? Vonda. A German word from which we derive a word or amazement, astonishment. It, yeah, if you could come on up, that'd be helpful. It describes an object of astonishment so beautiful and so magical that to, to love it is indescribable. And to lose it is insufferable pain. This is what we're going to find as we open up our text, Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. And I want you to be thinking about what is it that you see? And that question, laddie, don't you even read your Bible? Will come out at the end. And I want all of us to answer it in our hearts according to this text. Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. I'll give you 10 seconds to find it. There, does everyone have the text? So what we're going to do is this is a parable. A parable is a short story that has a setting, it has characters, and it has a plot. And the plot moves very, very quickly. It starts off and then it all, all of a sudden it ascends to heights unimaginable with this tension that is increasing, rising ever such until it hits the peak. And then there's this climax and there's this, oh, followed by this, this descent into resolution and some applications. It's like a roller coaster. And so that's what we're going to be on, and it's very quick. So this is what I'd like us to do. You can remain seated. Normally we rise in reference um, to uh, God's Word. But what I want us to do is just remain seated because I'm going to read it twice. The first time through, I just want you to look at the setting, the characters, and then you'll sense this, this tension rising. Just try to sense the plot. And then the second time through, I want you to either close your eyes or, or just look up here or, or something and then just try to imagine yourself in this storyline as a spectator, if not a participant. Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12, we read these words. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on, on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. 
and so with many others. Some they beat, some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to the tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he, he sent to them another servant and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another And him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat, some they killed. And he still had one other, a beloved son, finally. He sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him. And threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants. And give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him for fear of the people. For they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I want to come to you and say thank you very much for this moment. I pray for safety from the unseen entities that would hate to have the gospel sown out onto soil. I pray that our ears will be unstopped, our eyes will be opened, our hearts will be tenderized, the Holy Spirit will enable us to enter into this moment in a way that is dazzling to our hearts. Truly see Vongda, an amazing, astounding thing that when we love it, it is indescribable joy. When we lose it, oh my word. It is insufferable pain. Help us now for your sake, your glory, to listen intently. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we have before us is a, is a um, freeze frame, if you will. Um, the gospel according to Mark started off quickly, and it has gone with rapid speed up to this point. It's all about Jesus Christ. You can read chapter 1, verse 1. It says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He could not be any clearer. What is this about? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so all through the the gospel here, he's been uh, putting himself forward as the Messiah. Albeit a little mysterious, enigmatic, not quite sure who he is, or, or, or rather, what a Messiah ought to look like. He came in verse 15, chapter 1, and he said, The kingdom is at hand. Repent and be baptized. So off Jesus went, and you can see his identity, you can see his mission, you can see all these things. 
But you also notice another character. We're going to call them a group. This group, we're going to call them the, um, the doctors of theology. These are, these are people who gave their life to the Old Testament. And they knew the Old Testament inside out, upside down. They could quote every place. They probably had the whole Old Testament memorized. They hated Jesus. Not all of them, as we'll see maybe later in, in this passage, but most of them hated him. Not just merely disagreed or maybe disliked. They hated him. And, and right at the beginning, in chapter 3, you can see, we're going to kill you. Murder. Kill. Slaughter. Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so on and on the story went. And so we get up to chapter 11, and last week, Pastor Adam gave us a strong message about divine authority. Jesus now is moving into the passion narrative. That means uh, one week, he's in Jerusalem now for the last time, physically. And he's moving towards the temple and he's moving towards the cross. And this whole thing is about the gospel. And so he shows them his divine authority. He displays it. He discusses it. They're, they deject it. And now we come to a story. The essence of that was the scribes, the chief... Um, the chief priests, and all it's the Sanhedrin, the leadership of the Israel came to me, came to him and, and, and looked at him and said, Who in the bleak do you think you are? A human being talking about Christ, right to his face, right in his face. And so today he hits a pause button. Uh, uh, a freeze frame, and here is a picture. Here's a word picture. Here's a parable to answer that question. Who do you think you are? Well, let me tell you a parable. Now, this parable on the on the surface, most of us can can follow it well. Um, you you see an owner, and you see tenants. They're farmers, and he takes care of this beautiful vineyard. And then he gives it to the tenants and says, farm it well, and I will come back, and the dues that you owe me will be a, a part of the, uh, the harvest. And there was an agreement and whatnot, and so he went to another country. So there's, there's a distance between the tenant farmers and the owner, who is a long ways away. And so the, the owner sends for the, some of the crops, and you see how it went. There was... There was uh, a, a total rejection of the owner. And it went on and on and on and on. Now, now, what's going on in this? Well, he's talking to people who know the Bible. They might not believe the Bible, but they certainly know the Bible and the stories of the Bible. And so all through this parable, you're going to hear echoes of Old Testament. He, he only quotes one. Psalm 118, 22 and following, and I can hardly wait to get there. But all through this parable, you'll hear little echoes, and, and it's resonating through Old Testament passages. And he knows that they know exactly what he's doing with it. So keep your finger here, and let's take a look at verses 1 through 5. What we're doing is we're just looking at the gospel. And the gospel is entirely God's doing, and it is absolutely marvelous in our eyes. That's all we're doing today. The gospel is entirely God's doing, and it is just vonda, just marvelous in our eyes. So he gives us this parable, and he starts off with movements. The first movement here We'll call it God's kindness. Over and over and over again, he sends his emissaries, his prophets, 
his missionaries, people with the gospel. And he's going to Israel. And let's see what happens. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 7. And if you don't want to thumb through all of these, that's perfectly fine. We'll go back to Mark chapter 12 in just a second. But Jeremiah chapter 7, there is evil in the land. And they're just getting ready to be sacked by the Babylonians and taken into foreign territory. And the temple is going to be razed, meaning destroyed. And people are going to be slaughtered. And this is a very bad situation. This is judgment descending upon these people. And he says this in verse 25. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt, so think Moses, think Exodus, to this day, think like 600 B.C., I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day after day after day, yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Now, the leaders of Israel know this passage very well. And the parable is saying they sent, sent, and sent, and sent. Never listened, never listened. In fact, started killing. All those prophets clear up to John the Baptist. Remember what happened to him? They killed him. These leaders know something. They're getting a little nervous. Jesus is just telling them a little story. And can you see Jesus, all authority, looking at the Sanhedrin, these monstrous, huge, authoritative humans who keep people in shackles because they know the Scriptures and the common people don't know the Scriptures. And he just bears down and looks at them. And gives them this story. Now they're starting to sweat a little bit. But it gets worse for them. One of my commentators, I I like this man, Richard B. Hayes. If you want to write that down and look up some of his work, I think that you'll delight in his insights. He called this parable an improvisational riff on an old song. (laughs) Now some of you are going, what the heck does that mean? Some of you who are more musical could probably go, oh. See, see, Jesus takes a song that's 750 years old. It's found in Isaiah chapter 5, and we'll go there. And he, he takes it, and it's an improv. It's right in front of these people, and he retells it, restories it, so that it now presses right on their necks. And they know this song very well. It's a common passage in Israelite scripture. So Isaiah chapter 5, all these details that that, uh, Jesus uses certainly tells us of the kindness of God, certainly tells us of his character, certainly tells us of his patience and endurance, but it reflects Isaiah 5. Verses 1 and 7 says, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared the stones and planted it with choice vines and built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yield wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah... Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When you looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I'll remove the hedge and it shall be devoured. I'll break the wall down and it shall be trampled down. The Assyrians and the Babylonians are coming in and raising, racking havoc to this place. I will make it a waste, and it shall not be pruned or hoed. Briars and thorns shall grow up. I 
will also command the clouds. The rain will not rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. Righteousness, but behold, an outcry. And then you keep reading, and wrath is descending upon Judah and Israel. Now Jesus wants these leaders to hear the thunderclaps and the lightning bolts in the distance and starting to billow and move towards them. They know this is about judgment. And then he twists it, and it's not about Israel per se, not about the common people per se, but the leaders. And he turns it and puts it right on them. The kindness of God over and over again. Romans 2 verses 4 and 5, you can jot that down. You can see that his kindness is to lead us to repentance. But if there is hardness of heart, if there's blindness of thought, if there's a recalcitrant spirit that will not yield to the will of the Lord, wrath is being stored up and it will break out and it will be a horrifying thing. That's in the parable? The movement is starting. The movement is rising in tension. Over and over and over again, God sends forth His Word. How many times did this little boy in southwest Iowa hear the gospel? Over and over and over in the 60s and the 70s, and hardly did I give it any thought. I had my eyes pasted on Dan, and I thought I had my best interest at heart, and I was going to make life work. Over and over again, he put amazing people in my life. And over and over again, I pushed it out. Does that reflect any of you? Any? His kindness, mercies, generosities worked on me and finally opened my eyes to see what I was rejecting and opened my heart to softly and, and strongly hold to my Savior what happens in this story here? Well, we're not quite to the climax. It's going to take more than just people talking gospel, talking. There's got to be a central figure here. There's got to be the climax of the gospel. And so now we're moving out of the God's kindness into God's son killed. Why is that good news? Have you ever thought of that? Why do we say Good Friday when we turn out the lights and we're crying and we're under great duress that Jesus Christ was mutilated on an execution cross? This is good news. Stay with me. So we get back to Mark chapter 12. And keep in mind that Jesus is now starting to unveil his identity. In, in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, you can write that down. Mark chapter 9, verse 31, you can write that down. Mark chapter 10, verse 32 and following, you can write that down. He says, guys, listen to me. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed. And God's going to raise me from the dead. What is there that... You can't understand about that. Over and over, he's disclosing to his disciples, and they're still not quite getting it. And now, right in front of his enemies, he's going to disclose it. And the irony here is, here are my hands. Here's my body. Take me. You want to kill me? Do it. That's the passion narrative. And they take him and put him on the cross. Look with me again in the parable, verses 6 and following. He had still one other, a beloved son. 
finally he sent him to them. Now, beloved son, does that ring a bell to anyone? Yeah, this is probably the 50th message out of the Gospel of Mark. Pastor Garrison is here today. I rejoice, and all of you do too as well. He has shouldered a lot of these messages, 30, 40, 50 of them coming at us. It started in chapter 1, verse 11, and the baptism of Jesus. Do you remember that? And out from nowhere, this voice, God the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I find my delight. Oh, now we see that Jesus is the Messiah. And then in chapter 9, verse 7, we're up on a mountain, and there's a transfiguration. And there it is again. This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. My beloved son. So now we know his identity. Certainly, this is the Messiah. But what's so challenging about the gospel is nowhere in human logic do you have a king crucified as a good news. A Messiah, Christ crucified? Sounds like fried ice or something. It just doesn't sound normal. There's no logic to it. And in there, somehow, some way, out comes the good news of great joy for those who look upon the Christ and say, you are marvelous. The beloved son, there it is in the Gospel of Mark. There's his identity. But also, keep in mind that these guys in front of Jesus who hate him know the Old Testament. They don't believe it. But they know it, and they know the scriptural stories of Israel better than anyone. What are some stories that come to your mind? Genesis 22 comes to my mind, because I studied it, and I remembered those those numbers. Genesis 22, verse 2, it's Abraham and Isaac. Remember that story? And he's, he's commanded by God to take his, his son, his 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 beloved son, and take him up to the mountain of Moriah and the the wood that's on his back, his son's back, he's going to take off and put it on this sacrifice. And then he's going to bind his son and put him on the wood. And then he's going to take a knife and he starts raising it. And then God says, enough. God provides an offering. And so he looks at this offering, this beloved son that's, that's being killed. And he said, that's enough. I will view it as a completed sacrifice. And now you can take your son and go back, back home. It's a, it's a resurrection-like story that we find throughout the Old Testament. It's a powerful one. But then there's another one that these, these uh, leaders knew very, very well. And notice what the parable says, that the the, the beloved son comes, and so they get together. They love to get together and have little powwows. It's kind of strange. And they say, let us kill him. Come, let us kill him. That phrase is identical, word for word, to Genesis 37 verse, I think, 20. You can look at it, but it's, it's, um, it's Joseph. Remember Joseph? And his dad said, I love you. You are my, my one and only. I, you're my beloved son. Now go and tell your brothers a few things that is on my heart. And so when he went out to talk to his brothers, they grabbed him. Before they grabbed him, they said, Get a little powwow and say, come, let us kill him. Strange that that would be echoing into this parable. And they threw him in a pit and said, there, he's going to die. The Ishmaelites are going to take him away, put him in, I don't know what they're going to do. I don't care. We'll tell dad that he died and dad's going to go into grief, whatever. We're going to get the inheritance. That's, that's the main thing. And you know what happened? 
God spared him and then exalted him to the, to the preeminent place in Egypt so that his power could bring forth salvation for the people. Genesis 50 verse 20 said, you meant to harm me, but God meant it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Do you see a pattern? A beloved son who's going to get killed and come out of death somehow, some way, and rise to this preeminent place so that he can put forth salvation for all those who will put their hope and trust in him. They know the stories and they're getting more and more upset with this wannabe Messiah. Now we start moving into the third and final movement. This one we can call Sons Resurrected. You see, if we left it here, the parable would be solely about judgment. We get that. You treat Jesus Christ like that and kill him, you're going to get killed for all eternity, period. It's called judgment. It's called a death sentence for all of eternity. Wrath, just, righteous, white-hot anger against mutiny, against treason, against sin itself. And when I was reading some of the commentators, they would end it with judgment. And judgment is just saturating this parable. I get that. But it doesn't end there. He says, what is the owner going to do? Yep, you got it. He's going to destroy you. And give the vineyard to others. Who are the others, by the way? I beat my brow on that word, others. And it led me to up into verse 7, I think, or maybe 8, when it said he has one other. So other and others kind of connected. Maybe it's like Veritas. Maybe it's covenant members. Maybe it's true believers in Jesus Christ globally are the others, and the vineyard is going to be given to them. So there's a hint of help. Remember, we're looking at the gospel in a picture, and the gospel is entirely God's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Our, whose eyes are we referring to? Who is it? It's not the leader's. Hmm. And so now we start moving into how Jesus closes it and he pulls out his text. I don't know if he did that. He could quote everything he wants. And he went to Psalm 118. If you've got your scriptures, you can turn there in verses 22 and 3. But isn't it interesting that it's Psalm 118? Why Psalm 118? You guys know I love the Psalter. I get a kick out of reading all the Psalms and seeing patterns in it. I didn't know that answer. Until you start looking at it in Psalm 113, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. That's called the Hallels. The what? Yeah, the the Hallels. This is what the leaders of Israel would read and even sing to Uh, the congregation, right before Passover. And Passover is the slaughtering of the lamb to put the blood over the doorways of the people and get them out of Egypt and away from the destroyer and set free to go on a journey into the promised land. It's all picturesque of the gospel. And in Mark chapter 14, verse 1, it says two days before the Passover. So Jesus knows that they know what he's doing. And he says, don't you read your Bibles, laddie? Don't you understand? That was totally offensive to them. Totally. We do this every single year. We know our Bibles. Really? Well, 
Who's the stone that the builders rejected? And all of a sudden, magically or mysteriously, the stone becomes another stone. It's a cornerstone, a foundation on which the temple will be rebuilt. Now where are we going? Let's read that quickly and we'll close. Psalm 118. Oh, this is a good one, guys. Starting with verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love prevails forever. Verse 5. Out of my distress I called the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. Verse 10. All nations surround me. The name of the Lord... I cut them off. Verse 13, I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. Verse 17, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Verse 19, open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And then the last verse I'm going to read is, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. In it. Right before the eyes of the leaders, Jesus portrayed and proclaimed the gospel. And what did they do? Verse 12. They left him. And they will plot. And as we continue to proclaim the gospel according to Mark, they will have a chance and they will take it to kill him. And that's the irony of the gospel. Because it took the brutality of the crucifixion in order to bring forth the beauty of resurrection and salvation for all who will believe. So the question before us is, What do you see in this picture? What do you see? It closed with perception and eyes and and there's a sight issue. Those who read the Bible week in and week out saw a nuisance and a threat. And so they're going to kill him. What is wrong with these people? Mark chapter 12, verse 38, we come across the scribes. Look at it carefully and think with me, why can they not see the glorious realities of Jesus Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension? The answer, in part, is the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces. A misplaced desire. I want people to view me as, and you fill in the blank, and if that blank is holding your attention and keeping you in bondage, and desiring something from people for you, the scriptures will start looking dim and distant, and Christ will look like a pygmy and way out there, and maybe even a fanciful person in a plot of some sort. They wanted attention. They craved praise and affection and adoration, and they used their Bible to grab people's attention and stick their eyes right on them. And that was their good news. 
misplaced desire must be repented of in order for a well-placed desire on Jesus Christ in order to see and say with this passage, oh, it is marvelous in my eyes. Otherwise, we're going to look at worldly ways and marvelous things, and we will be blinkered. So to close this message, you have two groups in this passage. One who are unbelievers. Please don't leave this auditorium, if you have listened to the gospel and you go, whatever, it's not going to help me pay my bills, it's not going to help me get married, it's not going to help my aging body, it's not going to help my jalopy get down the road another month, don't you have anything practical for me? Don't leave with that thought because the one and only has been displayed before you who lived the life you should have lived and you didn't do it you're sinners who died the death you should have died and he rose in triumphant victory as the first fruits of the new creation he is the one and only he is the messiah he is our only hope but for others of you you have seen the christ again your heart's hopefully have moved upwards into a, an excitement, into a desire, into a joy, into a marvel over him. Now take that energy and move it outward. Right here is a vineyard. And this vineyard has been given to us to care for. What does that mean? All through the New Testament, it's one anotherings. We love one another. We give preference to one another. We serve one another. We pray for one another. We sacrifice for one another. On and on and goes. And by His Spirit through us, the vineyard flourishes because it has been taken out of the hands of the old and put into the new, into Jesus Christ's hands. That's the new covenant. That's the church of Jesus Christ. Don't Take your role lightly. Use the energy by His Spirit for joy in Jesus to move outward and to help people flourish in the vineyard. All for the sake of the glory of the owner of this vineyard. Let's pray. And we do want to pray, Father. We want to pray and continue to pray over and over again. Open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things in your word. Help us to see with clarity and cogency the main character, the epicenter of all the scriptures, Jesus himself. Help us to be dazzled by him, to marvel over him, to be awakened to his splendor. And out of that, help us to sacrifice for your people in a way that honors you and glorifies you with our bumper crop, our flourishing vineyard for your renown. We thank you in advance for the work you're doing in our lives, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.